You're listening to Parenting Our Future. I'm parenting expert, Robin McMahon, author of The Yelling Cure and founder of Parenting for Connection. My podcast is all about providing you with the tools and solutions you need in all different areas of your parenting so you can create strong connections with your kids, get all the cooperation you want, and live a life that is full of joy and connection. And by the way, the tools and solutions that you're looking for in your parenting don't just live in each episode of my show. They're also in my free membership site, The Parent Toolbox, where you can access tools created by myself and my brilliant guests that cover everything from helping your kids to sleep, managing meltdowns, reducing overwhelm to getting your kids to listen the first time and so much more. Join The Parent Toolbox so you can download and use the tools that are ready on the site and Each week, a brand new tool is added. And of course, the best part is it's absolutely free to join and to stay in. You can go to www.parent-toolbox.com today. Now let's dive into this next episode of Parenting Our Future. Hello, everybody. It's Robin here. Welcome back to another episode of Parenting Our Future. Okay, I have something to talk about today with a guest that you are going to love because he has. Oh my gosh. He has so much that he's going to help you with. And we're going to talk about career planning for our kids. Look, I know that we get really stressed out when we think about our kids' future. And sometimes we go into fear. We go into worrying about like our own experience and how we want that to be better for our kids and that sort of thing. So we're going to talk about all of that. We're going to talk about what they need, the things that they need that they aren't taught. And so I am so excited to welcome my distinguished guest, Mark Hirschberg, who he told me I could call him Hershey, but I won't do that. I'll just call him Mark. He is the author of the career toolkit, essential skills for success that no one taught you. Love it. He goes from, get this, get this. Are you listening? He goes from tracking criminals and terrorists on the dark web to creating marketplaces and new authentication systems. And Mark has spent his career launching and developing new ventures at startups and Fortune 500s and in academia. He helped start the Underground Practice Opportunities Program, dubbed MIT's Career Success Accelerator, where he also teaches annually. And just to one-up that even, at Harvard Business School, Mark helped to create a platform to teach finance at prominent business schools. He also works with many nonprofits, including Techie Youth and plant a million corals. Oh, and by the way, to throw a curveball, he's also one of the top ranked ballroom dancers in the country. Come on, Mark. Come on, Archie. That is the coolest thing ever. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> I love it. I, I was, uh, I think I almost fell off my chair when I read and prominent ballroom dancers. So that's so cool. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, welcome. So let's sort of dive right in and talk about what is career planning. And we know that our kids are getting career planning. I have teenagers. One of them's in grade 11. We're starting to talk about this. I'm seeing these messages from schools. And what are they doing wrong? They're not getting career planning. They're getting a career decision pushed at them. Decide, doctor, lawyer, accountant. They're generally not getting career skills and how to think about where you want to be at 20 versus 30 versus 40. Now, in fairness, we're not asking, we shouldn't ask a 16-year-old, by the way, where do you want to be when you're 40? So we should just be focused on the career decision. What field might you want to go into? Start thinking about a direction. That's fine. That's sufficient. And then the career planning, we start to engage with later, but we're doing it wrong because typically schools, I'm going to exaggerate this a little, but the classic way we teach this is we bring in our parents and say, Johnny's mom is a doctor and Sarah's dad is an accountant. They're going to talk about what they do. And then you're going to decide, do you think you want to be a doctor? Do you think you want to be an accountant? And so it's this very binary choice. And frankly, for a kid, if you just don't connect with Johnny's mom for whatever reason, uh, kids, you don't like what she's wearing. You go, I don't think I want to be a doctor. Look what she's wearing. I don't don't like to wear that. And we make these associations and we're really getting such a narrow view. In fact, we want to look at jobs differently. 
Now, let's take an example of how we often misconceive jobs. Right. Lawyers, that's a very common job. We all think we know what they're doing, but most of us don't. So if you ask anyone, what does a lawyer do? He's, oh, I get it. I can explain it. We've all seen them on TV. Mm -hmm. But what do you see on TV? You see the drama. You see them in the courtroom because that's what we want to watch on TV. Yeah. You know what you don't see? The 30 hours they spent sitting, doing research in the library, looking at prior case laws, being on their laptop. Most lawyers, in fact, never set foot in a courtroom. Right. Most lawyers are contract lawyers. And this is a common thing we see with law school students. They get excited because law school, you're talking about all, all this theory and really fundamental laws. And then they go into work and they sit in a room by themselves and review contracts. And they redline documents for hours and days on end. That's yeah. not what they saw on TV when they were 12. That's not what they did in their constitutional law class. But people didn't understand what a lawyer actually does. Yeah, so right. first, what we want to do is understand what exactly is the job? Yes, I get engineers build this and lawyers fight for their, their clients, but what does that mean? So I would encourage your children, every time they meet an adult, ask them about their job and ask them, what do you actually do? What's a typical week like? How much time do you spend in meetings? How much time you're on the road? You tend to work by yourself or with other people. And what we want to do is start to just explore the universe of options, but get those components. Then what you want to ask your child is not, do you want to be a doctor? Yes or no. You want to ask, what sounds interesting? Oh, I think I want a job where I'm constantly meeting new people mm -hmm. and a job where well, I'm doing engineering and a job where I get to travel. Say, okay, those are three things you want. Does a doctor meet it? No. Does the accountant meet it? No. Okay, let's find a job that might have that. If you look around, maybe you even ask your network, does anyone have a job like this? Oh, field engineer. Field engineer has all three. Okay, great. Let's introduce our kids, see if we can find a field engineer to talk about that job. So instead of just saying, here's a job title, yes or no, we want to get down to the components of a job, see what components our children resonate with, and then find the job that best matches that. Let mm. children construct jobs instead of just trying to find which hole is the best fit for their peg. Yeah, yeah, that's so that's so funny. Uh, not funny. I'm thinking of my 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 oldest son. He wants to be a lawyer. You want to know why? Because he's good at arguing. <laughs> so you can just imagine my life. <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> my mother dealt with the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, you're so right though because. I'm sure most lawyers don't even make it to a courtroom because they aren't doing that type of law. Like you say, you want to be a lawyer. Well, what kind of lawyer? You know, there's so many different kinds. And yeah. yeah. And most go into business law and contract yeah. law, but we certainly don't see those lawyers on TV. <laughs> and the few times we do in a show, for example, Suits, they over-dramatize it. It's yeah. great TV. Love yeah. the show, but that's not what being a lawyer is really like. Yeah, it's really kind of a snore fest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, it, but compared to the exciting life of a parenting coach over here, you know, this is this is this is the life. Um, okay, but let's talk about some actual tools and skills that we need. So, you know, okay. Let let me back up for a second. So when our kids and I and I want to say this and and paint this with a broad brush because I'm sure there's there's different ways that uh, schools are teaching career prep, but what what are the basics that they're teaching now and what are the actual tools that they should be teaching? In terms of what they're teaching now, that's going to vary greatly okay. from some private schools and charter schools. Yeah. through great public schools to mediocre public schools to mm -hmm. the low end stuff. So there's no, mm -hmm. it's not in the common core. This is what they need to learn. So it goes into- No I real think, curriculum. Language. Yeah. Okay. What they should be learning mm -hmm. comes from surveys done. We did some at MIT, but I've seen surveys at other universities and other places. And there is a common set of skills that- companies are asking for. And by the way, these apply equally well if you want to be an entrepreneur. Oh. The, ten, the 10 skills that I list in the book, these are not ones I just made up off the top of my head. These come from these yeah. surveys. Career planning, 
what I call working effectively. And these are skills like managing your manager, understanding workplace culture, workplace politics, interviewing. And interviewing is equally important, not just from the candidate side, but from the other side of the table. Now, for your students, they're just going to be candidates for the near future coming out right. of school, for example. But when you think about your own career, very often we are hiring our coworkers, but no one's trained us how to do it. Yeah. It's, it's like saying to your kids, okay, you're 16 now. You've seen me drive a car. You've sat in the back. You get what the gas does. Okay, here are the keys. Good luck. Try not to hit anyone. Yeah. But that's what we do in our workplace. We say, oh, well, you've been interviews before. New candidates coming in. Here are the keys. Try not to hit anyone. So learning interviewing skills is important too. Then there are leadership and management skills. And these skills are not just for people with senior titles, because it's not about authority over others. It is true leadership, true management, which is not by command. And in fact, all of us have to lead and manage other people. Companies want to see leaders, not people with titles, people who lead, which we can do at any level. Managing, anytime you've said to a coworker, hey, listen, we got to work on this project. How about you work on this and I work on that and then we'll come together. You're not in charge of your coworker, but those are using some management tools and understanding those tools will make you more effective even as an individual contributor. And then the last skills, communication, networking, negotiation, and ethics. Oh, huge. Wow. And that just doesn't come up. I remember having to learn how to network as much as an extrovert that I seem to be, I'm really truly an introvert. And it's hard to go into a room and network with people, but there's a way that you can do it, right? Where it doesn't have to be so daunting, right? Yes, there is. Now networking, so you heard about when you were young, I certainly heard about from my parents, my teachers, we all grew up hearing about. It. That's one of the skills we talk about more often. And everyone says it's so important. Because yeah. no one actually set us down and teach us such an important skill. Really? It's, it's beyond important. And it is scary <laughs> to do it, you know, right? But it is important to have it, have connections and negotiations, huge, huge. Yes. Yeah. Negotiation. So let's look at an example of just how powerful this is. Okay. Imagine you are 22 years old. You're just out of school you have a job offer for $50,000. But instead of taking the job at that 50,000, you learn to negotiate. Whether you've read my book, a different book, took a class, however, and you negotiate for 51,000, just a thousand dollars more. That's not a big lift. We can imagine doing that. It takes you about five, 10 minutes to negotiate. If you do nothing else in your life, if you sit there at that job for the next 40 years until you retire, you've earned $1,000 more for 40 years. In five, 10 minutes, you just got $40,000. I like it. But of course, you're not gonna stay in that job for 40 years. You're going to have raises, promotions, other jobs. You're going to negotiate that too. If you learn to negotiate, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earning. And we're just talking about jobs. We're talking about salary. In fact, learning to negotiate, you're going to negotiate not just your compensation. You'll negotiate maybe with customers, suppliers, partners. You might negotiate buying or selling a home. We negotiate all the time with coworkers. It's not about who's getting more money. It's about coming up with solutions and learning to be, get, be better it has this massive impact. Now, here's the secret. I use negotiations because it's easy to do the math. We thought thousand dollars, 40 years, 40,000, got it. Mm -hmm. But this type of ROI, return on investment applies to all of these skills. Mm -hmm. No one's going to say, oh, you're a better networker. Here's a thousand dollars more. Right. But by being a better networker, you're going to have access to more opportunity, whether it's jobs or customers or knowledge. Being a better leader is going to make you stand out more all of these skills, they're going to help you get that little bit extra that over the years adds up and adds financially hundreds of thousands of dollars, but more importantly, overall success and happiness. So it's worth investing in these skills and you don't have to be a master. Going from 50 to 51,000, that doesn't mean you had to be world-class, a master negotiator, you just had to get a little bit better. And that's the secret to all these skills. It's about getting a little bit better. Wow. That's really cool. I, I like that. And, and I think that 
when we talk about networking and negotiations, those are the first two things that that jump out at me as like really hard things to do that create a lot of anxiety and stress in people. I mean, so so does interviews and that sort of thing. But um, but if you if you have a foundation for how to do it, that's that does give you some extra confidence, right? Extra, you know, just to be able to go in there and 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 know your worth too, which is really hard to do. Now the thing is we often have this anxiety because we misunderstand what these skills are and how to do them. Each mm -hmm. of the chapters, and the chapters, by the way, you can read them independently. You can open the book and start a chapter eight and then go to chapter two and whatever you want. It's a toolkit. Pick up the tool you want. Each one has a mental shift and then how to execute with actionable tips. Oh, cool. So let me give you an example. The mental shift, this is... um making a little brief here, it goes a little mm -hmm. deeper in the book. You know it earlier, it's so hard to walk into that room of people and try and network. Mm -hmm. And we think about that master networker, it's the woman who walks in and 30 minutes later, she's got 20 business cards. You say, oh my God, how did she do it? Yeah. That's not networking. Right. That's the wrong mental model. Networking is relationship building. Mm -hmm. Imagine you go into yoga class this weekend, you meet some people, you meet some new women, go, oh, you ladies are wonderful. This is great. I'm going to enjoy hanging out with you. Hey, listen, next weekend, can you all come over to my house? I'm moving. I need you to help pack me up. Is anyone going to respond to that? No. New friends, people you just met aren't going to say, sure, I'll spend my Saturday packing up the boxes of a stranger. On the other hand, your best friend from college, the one you've known 20 years, you said, I really need you to come over this weekend. Of course, she's going to be there for you. And it's because you've built a relationship with her. This other woman you just met, she's a, she's a stranger. She's not that much different than the woman whose business card you just got the event. So the getting the business cards, what people think of as networking, that's step one of a long process of building the relationship. Right. And when you shift from, I have to collect a lot of business cards, trying to build relationships, but you know how to do that. We all have friends. You don't have to do it in a room of 100. If that's how you like to do it, great. Many people like to do it one-on-one, -on -one, meet for coffee, have that call, keep in touch. That's networking and that's something we all know how to do. And when you frame it that way, it goes from being, okay, I have to meet a whole bunch of strangers in 30 minutes to, oh, I'm just going to get to know someone. Hmm. That is really interesting. I really, I really like that. And it's funny because I have taken I have taken networking uh, and negotiation classes, and the the it, at the time it was a while ago. Uh, it was like, hey, get in, say hello, a couple things here, there, you know, whatever. Leave your card and then exit, and then another person, you know, you know, shake hands, give a card, exit. Yeah. And so what you're saying is we can build relationships instead, and and and. Uh, and you're absolutely right. That's that's what it comes down to. And and I'll tell you, I've been doing that uh, myself. And and this is a little bit of a side side conversation. But you know, I've been I've been using Instagram and social media. And so maybe this is this is a fit for what we're talking about. But I just want to add it in. And I've actually, you know, with people who are like minded. So let's say Brene Brown, for example. Right. I'll, I'll look at her feed, look at some of the comments, and then I'll pick somebody out and just sort of have a look at what what they're all about, what business they're in, what work they do, and then I'll leave them a voice message and just, you know, if it's authentic to me, and just say, hey, you know what? I just love what you're doing. I just wanted to say hi and introduce myself, and you know, just whatever. I have met so many people doing that. In fact, I, I'm met somebody and she's like, Oh, you know what? I know somebody that, you know, and it was completely random. And we have had so many great conversations. We're going to meet for uh, like a zoom date uh, coming up next week. And she's going to be on the show as well. So, I mean, it's so cool how you can make these relationships in unique ways too, where you don't have to go to a networking event, right? Absolutely. Now you're doing something very important there. You're following up, you're having that yeah. zoom date. Yeah. A common mistake people make, particularly online, is that they just add people. They add connections. Adding someone on LinkedIn and saying this person is now in your network, that's like <laughs> saying, I'm single. The woman I just swiped right on on Tinder, well, she's now my significant other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, we swipe right. We're in a relationship. 
Now we've expressed interest, but now we have to build that relationship. Likewise, if you've connected on LinkedIn to a stranger, you don't have a relationship yet. That's fine if that's how you want to start it or reaching out, but you're doing the important thing, which is you follow up. You have multiple points of contact and you build that relationship, which takes time. Mm -hmm. And that's how we need to think about relationship building. I like that. And to be clear, that wasn't my idea. Somebody had to tell me how to do that because I didn't know. (laughs) So, okay. Now, so there's a lot here working effectively. Oh, my goodness, that is not something that we learn how to do. Nobody teaches us that interviews, leadership, management. So there's a lot here. Communication is key to all of this as well. How, and, and you said, so, so how do you teach this in the book? It's important to understand we have a very standard teaching methodology used in most schools, high school and college, mm-hmm. that does not apply to these skills. If you think back to school, it is knowledge transfer. The teacher stands at the front and says, here is how to do long division. Here are the dates to memorize for the Civil War. And the students sit there and they take notes and they memorize. And then on a test, when was the Civil War? And they write down the dates, divide this number by that, and they follow the process. And that's great for teaching those. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. There is no formula for leadership. There's no three dates to remember to suddenly be a master networker. These are not skills you can just get academically. It's like teaching someone sports or public speaking. You can't just say, I'm going to stand at the board, tell you what to do, and now you're good. You have to actually do it. You have to engage, actively participate to learn. So the best way to learn these skills the way we teach them at the course at MIT, the way they're taught at top business schools is through peer learning. It's through getting people together to interact and discuss. Now, students also have the opportunity to practice. Different students can try leading, for example. You might lead your student organization. You might be your team lead on a project. We as adults, by the way, don't always get as much opportunity. I can't walk up to my team and say, hey, I'm going to try some new leadership technique this afternoon. And if I completely screw it up, say, okay, uh, do over. That doesn't count. Forget what I just did. doesn't work that way. But I can do some of that through these peer learning groups. So what you want to do is this is why I recommend certainly companies do with their employees, but you can do a version of this for your students. Get people together in groups and your your kids with their friends, talk to their parents, have them all come do this. Get them some content. Yes, you can use my book and I break down for different skills how to do it, but you don't need to use my book. You can use other books you might like. You can use articles or videos. Use a great podcast like this one. And so you get that content and you have them read the article or listen to the podcast episode and then talk about it and talk about what does leadership mean? Okay, we got this idea or let's take networking because we got a little into that. Networking is not just about the card, about the follow-up. Let's talk about times when you did follow up and how you built the relationship. Now, keep in mind that our experiences are going to be very different than for our students. And that's the other key point is that if I give examples of leading to a 14 year old, she's gonna have a little trouble connecting. She'll get it, but it won't be as relatable. But when they talk about their own experiences, when they talk about how she was leading her after school activity and the problems she had, because there was someone else who was pushing back on her leadership and what it meant, we might think, yeah, I lead a team of 500 people. I deal with bigger challenges than the two of you disagreed over what color you wanted for the school dance. But that was a very real and important experience to her. And that's where she is in her leadership journey. And my discussion of political battles with 500 people isn't going to be as relatable. So having your students, having your children engage and talk and share their own experiences, that's how they're going to learn and connect on these skills. <clears throat> hmm. That's really interesting. And I think as parents, we need to give our kids the space to have their opinion and allow them to have different opinions from us too. And I think we need to zip it 
<laughs> and just listen too, because then it becomes a lecture, then it becomes an argument, right? And that's not what we want to do. And I'm just thinking about how we take what you just said and how, you know, parents can be sometimes, right? Myself included, I can, I can get that way. But here's what I know. When you talk to your kids and really listen to them about a topic or bring something up or bring kids together, they're incredible in the way they think. You know, I mean, somebody that I talked to said, yeah, if there is a problem in the world, bring a bunch of teenagers together and they'll solve it, you know, because they don't know all the ways it won't work. Right. So I, I love that idea. And I think it's really powerful. And and so what you're saying is that these are not there's no it's not formulaic in how you learn to be a great leader, how to, um, you know, communicate and, 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 and be in management, that sort of thing. You have to really experience it. Right. And I, yeah, go ahead. In the definition of a great leader, six different people will have six yeah. different opinions on what makes a great leader. Yeah. And here again, if that is a little foreign to you. Here's an exercise you can do yourself. Come up with your favorite leaders. They could be people, you know, personally, people you just admire. They might be politicians or business leaders living or dead. They could be fictional characters. It doesn't matter what. Come up with who these people are and then ask yourself, why do you see this person as an mm. example of leadership? What is it this person does? What are the attributes and skills? And what you'll find, it's like saying someone is a great athlete. For any given sport, you can have different athletes who are great in very different ways. And there's no universal, well, this is what it takes to be the best at this sport. There's no, this is what it takes to be the best leader. It's going to be different. And exploring that helps you understand your own leadership and your, your students, your children, they can do this as well. Interesting. Okay, now we're gonna share some really great tools that you have with, uh, with, with everybody in the toolbox, but I want to ask you about personality. So where does temperament come in? Right. Because people are going to lead in different ways based on the kind of temperament they have, the personality they have. And you, you list a bunch of different types of personality assessment, uh, that assessment tools, right? Like the Enneagram. Um, and then there's the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the five factor model, um, and so on. So where does that kind of come into play? First, let me note, there is some controversy over this. Okay. Some people say, I've heard people refer to Myers-Briggs as astrology for the business world. And they okay. claim there's no supporting evidence. I do put stock in at least some of these tools. Mm -hmm. Not saying I agree with all of them. I've done a number of them. I certainly get a consistent personality across them. And so I found them useful for me. If you disagree with them, don't find them useful, ignore that tool. You don't have to pick up every tool in the toolbox. Right. But if you want to use it, I think these tools are helpful and they're helpful in a few ways. It helps you understand your style and how you like to engage if you share with others and at companies, they will have everyone take this type of assessment. By the way, they're assessments, not tests, because there's no right or wrong answer on them. They're assessments. But if I understand your style is different than mine, that's going to be helpful in how I engage with you and recognize that if you're a big picture person and I'm a detail oriented person, that's why we're constantly butting heads because you're way up here and I'm way down here. And we have to recognize, okay, hey, Mark, you're getting too much into the details. Let's let's come back up and just, I want to make sure we have the big picture clear. I go, mm -hmm. oh, okay, because I was getting annoyed. You were ignoring what I think is really important. But okay, you want to you talk about this for a moment. I get. Yeah. So they're going to help us communicate. The other thing they help us do is understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. So one thing I had to understand, it was kind of obvious, I just didn't pay attention to it, is that I prefer chocolate chip cookies over salads. That's why I, ate a lot of, I know I'm, I'm funny that way. It's why I would eat a lot more cookies than salads. And at some point I said, this is probably not good for me. I should eat more salads, <laughs> but if I just go in my default state, I will pick the cookies. Right. So I need to be conscientious in picking salads. I say, hey, I should have a salad now. I need to force myself. I don't need to be conscientious of, hey, have I had a cookie lately? No, that happens naturally. <laughs> but I need to be more intentional with my salads. 
<laughs> the same thing with these skills. I don't have to be intentional to look at something analytically to do the math. That just happens naturally for a guy like me with multiple degrees from MIT. But there are other perspectives that are not so natural to me. And you can see in the assessment tool what's natural, where your preferences are, and recognize areas that are not your preference are probably areas you're not focusing on. You haven't developed those skills as well. And you need to be more conscientious in the skill development and application. I love that example. Uh, so I wonder where you consider emotional intelligence in this whole equation, if you will, of these 10 steps, because that's got to be woven into all of it, right? You know, you can be the smartest guy from MIT, but if you're kind of a jerk and nobody wants to work with you and you're not aware of your, your own, you, you know, you lack self-awareness or you can't understand your emotions or the emotions of somebody else, and, you know, that person who's a big picture person where you're a detailed person, you may think, well, you just don't get me. You don't understand me. You don't like me or you're out to get me or whatever it is, right? Whatever story we want to tell ourselves. So I think there needs to be that basis of emotional intelligence too, to understand people, which is why I like the personality assessment tools. That's one of the reasons why I brought it up. But I just want to hear from you about how you think about that part. That underlies a lot of what the book is about. If you think about what you do in school, it is about getting the right answer. Mm -hmm. Literally on the test, there is a blank and you have to put the right answer in the blank. And all we do in high school, in college, it's provide the right answer. But the real world isn't about just getting the right answer. Your boss doesn't say, hey, here's a triangle, please calculate the angles for me, put on this piece of paper and slip it under my door. Your <laughs> boss doesn't give you a, this is the exact problem, and now you have to come up with the answer. You have to, at times, ask the right questions. Mm. Even when you get the right answer, you have to convey it to the right people in the right way. Mm. Having the right answer, but not being able to lead people, that's not going to help get them where they need to go. Not having a good network means you can't reach the right people. Not being good at communications means you can't communicate that answer. Yeah. Not being good at negotiating means when that answer requires partnerships with others that you can't do it alone, you're not going to be able to reach that collaboration. So really, these skills are about going beyond just getting the answer. That's technical knowledge. I don't just mean science or engineering. Technical could be accounting or grammar, it's knowing what to do, the problem, but then taking that technical solution and applying it in the world in which we live. And that's something we don't really emphasize or teach well, even at the college level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a really, really good point because having the answer and being able to convince other people that, that to go along with that and lead them to that absolutely takes, it's hard actually, it's really, really hard. Uh, so, okay. So, so that, that's really, that's really, that's really great. Really great to hear. Now I want to know about what you say about the future of work in general. I think that there's going to be a big shift and we all have heard of the great resignation, for example, where people are saying, no, I'm not doing this kind of work anymore. But the fallout goes deeper than that, in my opinion, because it's also our kids that are seeing us burnt out and miserable and resentful and sometimes trapped. And they're like, oh, hell no, I'm not going to go into a job like that, a career like that. So I don't even want to talk about career and all this. I, I do not want what you have. So, so there's two questions that I'm asking. What, what about the future of work? And I think these 10 chapters in the career toolkit will help leaders be better leaders and better uh, empathetic leaders and, and that sort of thing. But also what about the jobs that aren't invented yet? Like I, you know, started out saying like my job was not a job that existed before, you know, I don't know when, but it, you know, when I was a kid, of course I wouldn't have even thought of that. So, so how do you see the future going? Okay. So those are two big, broad questions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> two first. It's an evolution, not a revolution. This is not a massive sea change. We're continuing the direction that we've been going in. Now, we've accelerated that. We've had a bit of a bigger step lately because of the pandemic. Mm. But really, the trend that we had been seeing 
is we are seeing a change in the capital labor contract. It used to be, you come and do this work for me and I will pay you as long as I'm paying you competitively. And that might be more than just salary, but I am paying you in some type of fairly monetary remuneration. Mm -hmm. But what we started to see in the last 10, 15 years, and it's accelerated, is that people say it's not just about pay, it is also about workplace culture, it's alignment to mission, it's my own growth and development, it's engagement from the company. Certainly we've seen in the last two years, is the company supporting me? Are they saying, we understand this is stressful for you too, how can we help you versus suck it up, things are tough all over. And so mm. people are saying, it's not just about the financial component anymore, we care about all of this. And the companies that are starting to do better during the talent wars right now are the ones who are engaging and offering not just financial remuneration, but matching on multiple fronts. So we've seen that tr change. It began with the millennials and it's become very accelerated. And I think we'll see it a lot more with Gen Z. So it's alignment to mission and some of these other things that will continue to change. With working from home, here's the big thing. It's going to take about two to three more years to solidify. If the economy falls off a cliff tomorrow, if we jump to 12% unemployment, guess what? Companies can then say, you want a job? You're coming to the office five days a week. Deal with it. And everyone will say, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. If this persists for about another two or three years, I think it'll be institutionalized that the companies will now fully shift to working part-time or some fully remote. And that will just be institutionalized. And even during a recession, they're not going to say, come back in, because that's just a standard now. Right now, if it changed tomorrow, everyone would say, well, the pandemic was special, but back to what we call normal. So I think if, if we can keep the bull run in the economy for another two or three years, which I think we will, it will solidify. And I think that's going to happen. Now, I've run, even pre-COVID, virtual teams, hybrid teams, I've done part-time in the office, that all works. You don't need to be there typically five days a week unless you're on an assembly line. But some of the views of, oh, well, I can go be on a beach in the South Pacific for my New York job. You can technically, in the short term, we know mechanically you can do it. Longer term, there will be some limitations. It's those water cooler conversations that you're going to miss out on. Mm -hmm. It's the relationship building, the internal networking that will lead to promotions and opportunities. So I think you generally need to be within driving distance of the office, just able to commute there and be there a certain amount of time. I think we're going to go to somewhere around three to four days a week as the, as the default. I, I totally get what you're saying there because I was, uh, in, in my corporate career, I was lucky to be one of a very small handful of people that could work from home. I did have a desk at the office if I wanted to. It was sort of just a, it, you know, somebody else could just as if easily sat there. Um, but um, you definitely lose out on sort of the, not the gossip as much as just like the buzz, right? What, what, like, what are people talking about? And uh, you, you do miss those connections. And when people see you, they remember you. It's like out of sight, out of mind, right? When you're not there. So I do really agree with you on that. I do, however, love being able to work from home. Uh, but you're right. You do miss out on just being a part of the conversation and connecting with people and that sort of thing. So you're absolutely right about that for sure. And I know it's such a novelty to work from home. And, and I think that having, having a hybrid of both is really, is really a good idea. Um, okay. So what about these jobs that aren't, we don't even know what they're going to be yet. So I'm going to borrow a philosophy that I learned at MIT. Okay. Now I was a computer science major and everyone would lament at MIT. We were learning a language called scheme, which you've never heard of because no one uses scheme except some academics. Okay. But that's what they would teach us at MIT at the top tech school, top computer right. science school in the world, and they're teaching us this obscure language. And what they said is, this is a good language to teach you the fundamentals. Whatever language we teach you, we know that's not what you're going to use. It will evolve. We've seen this. We can see what's coming. We're not going to teach you 
the particular language, we're going to teach you how to think because you're smart enough, you'll figure out the language. And it's true, the languages I use today, the technologies I use today, they did not exist when I was in school. In fact, even the nature of the programming I'm doing, I went to school in the early 90s. Tim Berners-Lee had just created the World Wide Web. In fact, I remember seeing it when it was still a couple hundred pages, but no one had any idea we'd be doing web development, that all our services would be running as SaaS, as software as a service in the cloud. Cloud itself didn't exist. Yeah. But MIT wasn't trying to say, well, here's how to build software today. So here are the principles of building software. Once you get, apply it in the domain that you're in. And that's how we need to train for tomorrow. The skills we've talked about, leadership, negotiating, networking, communication, managing, these aren't domain specific. These do not change. How you execute might change. There might be different tools. There might be different needs. The dynamic and style of leading in 1960 is different than how you might lead today. But if you understand what leadership is about, you can adapt your style and you can incorporate the new tools. So that's how we need to think about learning is not just learn this tool, the tool itself, learn how the tool works, whether it's an abstract tool like leadership or a concrete tool like how we solve this engineering problem. So when you see other problems in the future, leadership or engineering, or whatever your field is, you can address it using the fundamentals. And that's how we need to teach students to think. And by the way, this is something critically important. Every class, certainly at the high school level and at the college level, the classes all have some type of meta lesson. There's something they are trying to teach you how to think, not about the domain specific knowledge. Hmm. So here's my, my favorite, because everyone complains about this, geometry. Everyone says, oh, I hate geometry. Why do I have to learn it? How many times is my boss going to come to me and say, quick, right. is this a triangle or parallelogram? And I have to come up with the answer. Yeah. The reason we teach you geometry is because you do two column proofs in geometry. You might recall doing that. You might see your children doing that. Yeah. That is teaching you how to think and reason, how to draw mm -hmm. conclusions from assumptions. To start from, here's what we know. We think this is true. Now let's prove that it is true and taking you step by step. It's very easy to do that with geometry. That's like the baby version of doing that. In real life, it's messier. The world is messier. We yeah. often do that in our social circumstances where the data is not quite as clear. The logic's not so absolute. But if you understand the lesson in geometry, you understand how to derive conclusions from assumptions. And that's what you need to take away. And every class is like this. So if you get those lessons, you're well equipped. If you just said, I memorized how many sides in this object and what the angles are, that's not going to serve you well later. Oh, that's such a great point. That's a really great point. And, 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 a, and a point that I tell my kids all the time, I know you don't care about this, but this is about critical thinking, right? And so what I what you said to sort of recap it in my own words is that all of these lessons are the foundation that that allow you to be able to pivot and and work in different places and and do different kinds of jobs because these are all universal truths that this is important skills and tools to have for anybody and everybody. When I look at what I've done from running software engineering teams to being a speaker to the book and promotion of the book, the app and the business I'm launching with that, the skills that I have, I have to learn the domain. I had to learn about publishing and what the publishing world is like, but knowing how to engage with people and build relationships and negotiate partnerships I know how to do that. I just had to do it in a different discipline. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we want to focus on these skills. They give us a better ROI than I learned to program in Fortran, which <laughs> I did long ago. And I used it once in a summer internship and I've never used it again and probably never will. Yeah. So really these fundamental skills are where we want to focus. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's really important too. So the career toolkit is your book, Essential Skills for Success that no one taught you, but 
Hershey's going to teach you. <laughs> so Mark Hirschberg, just to say your name properly, where can we find your book? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the, the, the toolkit stuff that you have for us, which is so exciting. So where do we find the book? Where, where can we get the app? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. Okay. There you can see where to buy the book, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. You can get it at local bookstores if you order it through them. Okay. You can get in touch with me or follow me on social media. I put out new articles every week. There is the free companion app to help you better learn and retain the information. That's available from the iPhone and Android stores, the Career Toolkit app, and it's linked from the website. And then the resources page with a whole bunch of free downloads and free tools, which includes links to free online assessment tools. So I tried to find free tools online. There's also paid versions of these links to some case studies, a bunch of free downloads. I think we're going to talk about in a moment. So yeah. all of this at the career toolkit book.com. All right. Love it. And we'll have everything in the show notes. So please, please check it out. I'm telling you what you're going to get in the, in the toolbox from the career toolkit book is the, I, we're, we're going to say toolkit and toolbox a lot here, but the career toolkit development program, download that for free career plan questions. I love this. I can see just like sitting with my kids and just talking, like, let's talk about this guys. Like, where do you want to go? Uh, what do you want to do? What interests you? Right. And then candidate interview questions, super helpful. And then the career toolkit hiring sheet. And then you have all of the, I mean, you have so much, but the person personality assessment tools, uh, there are there as well. So, um, I just want to thank you so much for this information and really saying, okay, you know what, there are universal fundamentals that we can learn and helps, I don't want to say should, but should learn um, that there may be a gap in, in the school that you're at. They may not be teaching you these things, but boy, are they important because they can make you more money. They can make you have a happier life and they can make you have a more fulfilling career, right? Absolutely. This is your path to success. I love it. Thank you so much, Mark. It's so great to meet you and to talk to you. And I hope everybody will check out your book and you. And I just think this is such a great guide for so many parents who are worried, are worried about this. So thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for listening to this edition of my podcast, Parenting Our Future. I'm parent coach Robin McMahon. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with someone who you think might also need to hear this message. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you like my work, I'd be grateful if you gave me a five-star rating. For those of you who like my content and want more, visit me at yellingcurebook.com to get your copy of my book and to find other resources to help you. Until next time, I am wishing you and your family peace and care.